Good morning. Good morning. morning. Amen. Have a few announcements to give you. First of all, the flowers you see here in front, the purple ones, they have been given in honor and memory of Herb Garner. Um, Herb is a, a saint of the church who passed away, and we had his funeral on Friday. So we thank his family for that. Please fill out the yellow cards that are in front of you. Uh, there should be some. If you can't find any, um, there's some on that back table. This is how we track our attendance also. There's a place for you to put your address, an email address, if you want to receive our, our uh, announcements and newsletters. And also, there's a, on one of the sides, there's a place for you to, to list your prayer requests. We invite you to do that, uh, even though we will have a time of sharing this morning, uh, because we gather all those together for our prayer meetings. Uh, we have a prayer meeting every Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., and we invite you to join us if you're not doing anything at that time. The Youth Fellowship will meet uh, tonight at 6 p.m. at the Zion House, which is on the other side of the Parsonage, and um, that's at 6 o'clock. Next week, we will be meeting at Mount Pisgah, United Methodist Church. If you need a ride, people will be here probably around uh, 5.30, quarter to 6, and um, we'll be able to take you up. So if you need a ride, meet us here at the church, and we'll take you up. That's next week, and that we're lengthening our time together. Tonight it'll be 6 to 7.30. Next Sunday it'll be 6 to, to 8. And if you're in 6th grade or 6th grade to graduating, you can come to youth group, and we hope that you do. Bible study will be on Tuesday, September 26th at 7 p.m. Our Daily Bread is a... Um, a program that feeds the hungry, and we participate in that. It's in York. Um, it's on Friday, September 29th, and there are some casserole dishes in the back with a recipe. Okay. Carol, would you raise your hand, please? This is Carol. Um, just as a preliminary, if they're going to help, what time do they need to be? Uh, are they going to meet here and then carpool, or they meet there? Okay. Okay. And by that paper, you mean the sign-up sheet? The recipe. Cool. Thank you. Ministry Council will meet on Tuesday, October 3rd at 7 p.m. Church Council will meet on Tuesday, October 10th at 7 p.m. The Pastor Parish Relations Committee will meet on Thursday, October 12th at 11 a.m. This is an important meeting and I'm hoping that you can be there if you're on, in that committee. United Women of Faith will meet on Tuesday, October 17th at 7 p.m. Yes. Okay, we're having a um, covered dish. And are we starting early because of that? Six o'clock. I said seven. It's going to start at six. Okay, that's October 17th. That's a Tuesday at 6 p.m. Ladies, even if you've never come, come to that. And it's a great time. I'm the token guy. They let me come. I'm not sure why, but it's fun. It's fun. Um. Worship Committee will meet on Thursday, October 19th at 7 p.m. Our Community Trunk or Treat will be on Saturday, October 28th at 5 p.m. What time are they allowed to set up? Four. Four o'clock. Thank you. Looking ahead, and I know that this is a little ways off, but uh, our Book of Discipline, that, that document that outlines the laws of our church and our doctrine, requires that we announce this ahead of time. We're going to be having our church conference on Sunday, December 10th at 11.30 a.m., right after this service, right after the traditional service, we will be having our church conference. Now, what is a church conference? Our church conference is an annual meeting where we elect the officers for the coming year and set the pastor's salary, and we uh, go over several reports, some of which look at the condition of our buildings. We have three of them. Um, 
ministries, membership, those kinds of things. Um, our assistant district superintendent will be bringing the message for both Donning Grace and the traditional service. That's December 10th. Um, church conference is at 11.30 a.m. Are there any other announcements that need to be mentioned? Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. That's when you say, excuse me, pastor. Excuse me, pastor. Oh, hey, you can go. Here. Yeah. But it sounds like October's busy. Starts next weekend. Uh, we have, I just want to announce that we have the turkey suppers coming out, up. October 14th is the first one. October 28th is the second one. And it's also that time of the year that we have the East Prospect Lions Club has their pit beef sale to support Bible Adventure. Last year we raised over $2,000. That was put towards transportation to get the children back and forth from school. Uh, you can uh, buy tickets for $8 a piece, or we'll take donations. You can see myself, Don Barshinger, uh, yes, Jim Gemmel, Ken Gockenauer, or Jay Holcomb. Any one of us can get you tickets, or we'll take the donation. So that is the 21st of October. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, let's prepare for worship as we listen to the opening voluntary.
Amen. Thank you. Would you stand for the call to worship? The words are printed on the screen before you. Give praise to God who spread a cloud for covering and gave fire to light the night. Seek the Lord and the strength that only God can give, a presence that continually abides. Let us make a joyful noise to the Lord, the joy of our salvation. Our opening hymn is number 57. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, the words are also on the screen before you. Number 57. Oh, Lord, it would take forever to tell of all your deeds, an eternity of boasting about how great you are. The heavens could not contain our bountiful expressions of your grace and mercy. The seas would flood ashore with the expense, uh, the expanse of your love. Yet we are bold to bring you our praise and thanksgiving. We delight to remember how you care for us all. Be pleased with our offerings of unbridled devotion and accept our attempts to give you the worship you are due. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 105. We'll be reading verses 1 through 6 and then 37 to 45. Psalm 105, beginning with verse 1. The words are on the screen. I invite you to join me responsively as it um, is printed there. Hallelujah. Thank God. Pray to him by name. Tell everyone you meet what he has done. Honor his holy name with hallelujahs. You who seek God, live a happy life. Remember the world of wonders he has made, his miracles and the verdicts his, he's rendered, O seed of Abraham, his servant, O child of Jacob, his chosen. Egypt was glad to have them go. They were scared to death of them.
all because he remembered his covenant, his promise to Abraham, his servant. He made them a gift of the country they entered, helped them seize the wealth of the nations. Hallelujah. Amen. Our act of praise is number 160. Again, the words are on the screen before you. Rejoice ye pure in heart. Our sermon text comes from Matthew chapter 20. I'll be reading verses 1 through 16. Matthew and the 20th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Hear the word of the Lord. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those who came who had been hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered them, one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, 
and the first will be last. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. really good. Shouldn't be surprised because they can sing. They can sing very well. Let's pray. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Amen. I was about 17 or 18 years old and uh, had been hired by the Free Methodist family camp to wash dishes. Close your ears, Wanda, because I don't do that. <laughs> Family camp lasted for about a week, and uh, there was always an evangelist that would uh, teach and then in the evenings preach an evangelistic sermon. On this one evening in question, I remember sitting in the congregation, listening, and the question was posed, what are your praises this evening? 
And people were standing up and giving praises, and, and, and they were great. Um, you know, all kinds of things. But then this young man who was sitting in front of me, I, I, I was 17 or 18, as I said. He was probably in his oh, early 20s. But he was one of those cool guys. You know what I'm talking about? He looked good. Everything he did just worked. When he opened his mouth, everybody listened. And so he stood up. And I'm, oh, okay, what's he going to say? And he said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. You know something? I can't remember what anybody else said, but I will never forget what he said. Not because he was cool, but because of what he said. God's amazing grace. And we need to keep that in mind as we listen to what I'm about to say. You see, because this, uh, this parable that we read from Matthew chapter 20 is difficult, isn't it? Well, for those of us who've been Christians for a long time and we know the lingo, well, we get it, maybe, maybe. But I would argue that there's just something off, something off with this parable that Jesus gave in Matthew 20. And, and let me set it up for you to explain. Times weren't all that different from today. There were those who had resources and those who didn't. Where you fit, fit on the curve of supply and demand, if you will, depended on what you had and what you needed. Relative to this parable, you'd think that the landowner was rich. And so he was the one with resources. You would think of the workers as those who were in need, and so they were those who needed resources. Well, in fact, it was the opposite. The landowner had a crop of grapes, and he needed it to be picked, and he needed it to be picked right now. And so he was the one in need, and the workers were the ones who had the necessary skills to meet his need. Well, I'm not completely sure. I suspect that grapes are a very fickle crop. And those of you who have grown them probably say, no way, Pastor, they're, they are so hardy, it's amazing. But listen, I suspect that if you pick them too early or too late, you miss some of the sugars. And uh, the wine may not be as good as you expected. Jay, am I right? Yes. Dr. Holcomb knows. I suspect that if the landowner in question harvested his grapes either too early or too late, he would lose out on quite a bit of money. So it stands to reason that he would hire a certain number of people in the morning. And then when he realized that the crop wasn't coming in as fast as it should be, he'd hire more. Still more as the day went on, and then at the, toward the end of the day, he would hire still more as the need arises. Now, that's the easy part of the story. We get that part of the story, don't we? We understand it. The difficulty comes when Jesus takes us to the end of the day and tells us the landowner's process of paying the wages. Normally, custom demanded that those who had worked the longest would get paid first and that they would get paid the most. After all, they were the ones who spent the most time in the field, spent the most time away from their families, did most of the work. So it stands to reason, doesn't it, that they would get the most. Now, the passage you read this morning says that an agreement was struck to pay the workers a denarius. Those workers that had been hired first. Some translations said that they were to receive a usual day's wage. Some translations say it was a penny. The message, that uh, modern translation written by Eugene Peterson, says that they received a dollar. The point is, not the amount, the point is that they received what it took to feed a family one day. Again, it stands to reason that a half day's, that a, that a, a half day's work would be, uh, net half as much, a third day's work would meet a third as much. Yet, in this particular instance, that would not be the case. 
Instead of making sure that those who had worked the full day were the ones who got paid first and the most, the landowner started with the last. Our passage reads, When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. And they each received the denarius. I can imagine the workers who had been in the field all day must, must have had some wheels going around in their head. At first they must have wondered what was going on. What, what is this guy doing? Doesn't he know that we're the ones to be paid first? However, their attitude probably changed a little bit as they saw each one getting paid the denarius. I suspect they thought, oh, they're getting paid a denarius. Surely we're going to get a bonus because we worked the hardest. Yet that was not to be the case. Indeed, everyone got paid the same. Now, I, can, I have to admit that I can understand why that first group began to grumble. I really can. Listen, I happen to be the oldest child in my family. And I have always said that my parents treated me far more harshly than they treated my siblings. They did. Even my parents will admit. Okay, they admit this. At any time I would touch the telephone, yeah, kids, when I was a kid, we had dial phones and they sat on a shelf and had this really long cord. Okay, we didn't carry these handheld computers. They said, every time you touch the phone, Jim, we slap your hands. But then my sisters came along, and they became different people. It was like, who are you, and what have you done with my mom and dad? They treated them with a whole lot more freedom. And then my brother, my brother who was born 17 years later, after me, got away with murder. I always complained that mom and dad let him get away with everything. Remember the parable of the prodigal son? I'm the older son. You never once threw me a party. That's just not fair. Then I became a parent. I realized that I never had the right to tell my parents how they should raise their children. My sense of fairness had nothing to do with the way that they showed each of us how much they loved us. And they did. And my little brother Edward, he's grown up to be a wonderful, loving, and responsible man. You see, we muddy the waters when we try to import our own particular sense of fairness into scriptures. The parable in Matthew 20 is not about fair labor practices. Jesus did not start the parable by saying, landowners and employees should act like this. He didn't say that. Jesus started the parable by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. And he went on. Furthermore, while there is a certain unfairness in this story, it's not for the reasons the group hired first were claiming. They had agreed to work for the amount that was paid. They had no reason to complain. The landowner was correct when he asked, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what, I, what belongs to me? My friends, if anyone had the right to claim an injustice, it was the landowner. The ones who had been hired last should have said, no, I do not deserve to be treated this way. Please take some of this back. But because they did not and because the landowner acted freely, the issue is not fairness. It is grace. Hear me. The issue is not fairness. It is grace. A grace, a favor rendered by one who did not need to do so. Grace, a gift given to someone who did not deserve it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and so, uh, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not the son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. 
Grace, a favor rendered by one who did not need to do so. Grace, a gift given to someone who did not deserve it. Christ Jesus, who though in the very form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. Taking the form of a human being, and being found in the form of a human being, humbled himself even to the point of death. Death on a cross. Grace, a favor rendered by one who did not need to do so. Grace, a gift given to someone who did not deserve it. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. My friends, this is hard for us to understand because our whole working lives are based upon an agreement that we will receive a fair wage for a fair day's work. In other words, do something to get something. Amen? There's no such thing in this world as a free lunch. This passage from Matthew chapter 20, however, has nothing to do with the world of work. Perhaps that's why it's so difficult for us to understand. We can't understand the one who was able, who was able to create with just a word. Why would someone so powerful care about me? The psalmist asked that question in Psalm 8, didn't he? Who am I that you should be mindful of me? We would feel better, perhaps, if God would require us to say, no, 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 I don't deserve to be treated with such grace. We might even feel better if God simply wiped us off the map. At least that would make more sense. But he didn't. And while that's not fair, it's wonderful. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, how I'd like to stop right there. I'd like to say amen and amen and just have an altar call and sing a song and go home can't there's an implication here that we must not miss the grace that we received from God and Jesus Christ was never to be private I cringe when I hear people say well my religion is a private thing forgive me if I'm stepping on your toes but you are wrong faith in Jesus, grace, the grace of God in Jesus Christ was always meant to be given away. It was given to us. And we are required then to give it to someone else. This becomes clear as we consider the context of our parable. It comes on the heels of Christ's treatment of the rich young ruler. You'll remember the story. A young man comes to Jesus and says, what, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well... Follow the commandments. And he gives the list. The rich young ruler says, oh yeah, cool, I've done all that my whole life. We do things like that, don't we? I've been coming to this church for 40 years. But Jesus would look at the young man, and, and I love how, he, how that says, he looked with him and had compassion on him. And he says, one thing you lack. Go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. At this, the young man hung his head and walked away. Kind of an aside, going to church, I, I said this before a hundred times, I'll probably say it another thousand. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than living in a garage makes you a car. This young man had done everything that he was supposed to. 
He never, however, surrendered his life to Christ. And so Jesus would say something like this. You know, it's easier for a rich man to get through, uh, get, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. Some theologians will point out, and correctly point out, that there is a gate in the wall around old Jerusalem called the eye of the needle. And it's so small that a camel can't hardly ever get into it. In fact, you have to take everything off the camel, get that camel down on its knees, and they have to crawl through. Okay, however, and get this, and this then will make it difficult for all of us because we all fit this mark. Luke, when Luke tells the story, now remember, Luke is a physician. Luke, when Luke tells the story, uses the term used for a needle that's used by doctors to suture. And he says it's easier for a camel to get through that little hole than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. Now, I've never really considered myself a rich man, but there are a lot of people in this world that look at me and say, man, you are wealthy. <sighs> and so I do something like Peter does at the end of that parable. Peter goes, we've given everything up for you, so what's in it for me? Right? Peter reminds me of myself and anyone else who would have attempted to go through the litany of all that we do and have ever done for God. I've been a pastor for 33 years. Some of you might say, I've taught Sunday school for as long. Or I've been involved in this or that ministry. Look what I have done. If we're honest... We'd have to admit that that list has more to do with bragging than it has to be of any kind of celebration for what God has done through us. Like Peter, we say, look, we have left everything and follow you. What then will we have? And Jesus says, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The truth is, though, it's not about me, and it's not about you. When we start putting ourselves ahead of the one who died that we might have life, we will get what we deserve, and that will be death. It's only as we deny ourselves, surrender our lives to Jesus, and follow in his footsteps that we receive what is not fair. Life. Grace. A favor rendered by one who did not read or did not need to do so. Grace, a gift given to one who did not deserve it. A campus pastor was teaching a college course on life and teachings of Jesus. As the date for the, the final exam came along, there were some who would, were studying so hard. Others got together with peer groups and, and studied all night. One even approached the pastor and said, I'm not going to be able to be here on that day. Can I take a makeup test? And the pastor professor, pastor slash professor said, well, yeah, but the makeup test is going to be a lot harder. The day of the exam arrived, students sleepily filled into the room, tired from the night studying. I, I can identify with this. I had this happen. This very thing happened to me. It's not my story, but I had it happen to me when I was in seminary. They're tired, and, and, and they get in, the, in their seats, and, and the professor stands up and says, Before we begin, I'd like to read a passage from the Gospel of Matthew. It's the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. The pastor closed the Bible and said, This reading says that it's all a gift it's all grace. So you've all made an A on your exam, and you're free to go. What? This would be me. In fact, it was. I had a professor do that. <laughs> I study for this. Listen, I'm a class A personality. I want you to know I got an A and deserved it. How can you say I don't have to take the test? You've got to be kidding. That's not fair. 
perhaps we all should have heard this next story. At an informal communion service, a certain pastor celebrated during Lent. He asked a group of people gathered, give me some names of people who are struggling. And as he waited, this little girl stood up and said, my dad is hurting. Now, he's not going to tell anybody, but, but he's hurting. And before the pastor could come up with something witty, the child turned to her dad and started hugging him. You know, dad, being a guy, tried to push her away. Embarrassed by this public display of affection, said, Come on, come on, Betty, you're hugging me to death. And the little girl said, No, Daddy, I'm hugging you to life. I'm hugging you to life. Sisters and brothers, we have a problem. And that problem is called sin. We can't do anything about it. It's not like taking a shower. It's not like putting on clean clothes. We can't do anything about it. Nonetheless, God has made a way for us. And that way is named Jesus. I know it's not fair. But it's good. If we received what was fair, we'd be dead. But God, God has hugged us to life. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. I was blind, but now I see. My friends, as I look out on this congregation this morning, I know that there are some here who have been a Christian a lot longer than I have. And yet I wonder, have you ever surrendered your life to Christ? Have you ever had the grace of God and Jesus just wash over you and lift you up? Do you know the peace that passes all understanding? As we sing our hymn, I'm inviting you, if you've never done that, or if for some reason you're just not feeling it this morning, come to the altar. Come to the altar and just cry out to the, cry out to the Lord and know that those who cry out to the Lord will be saved. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter who you are, how rich or how poor, how old or how young. Jesus died for you. The cliche is true. Had you been the only one alive, Jesus would have still gone to the cross for you. Our hymn is number 378. Amazing Grace. Would you stand as we sing together? The words are on the screen. If God is touching your heart this morning, surrender to Jesus.
with the Apostles' Creed. The, the words are printed on the screen before you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> And now, what are your joys and your concerns as we gather for prayer? Thank you for the rain. Amen. I'd like to thank all the ladies and men who helped us get together a, a lunch for the Garner family on Friday. Whether you set up tables and chairs, washed them all, baked the cake, or made other dishes and helped tear down. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say what a beautiful service it was the first time and thank the family and just very, very touching. Amen. I know when I was sitting here listening to the kids, who aren't kids anymore, but I cried. Yeah. I think everyone in the church did. Yeah. For those of you who do not know him, Herb uh, was a part of this church for, what, 56 years or more? Yeah. You will be missed. Pray for Pat. Pat. Pray for Pat Garner. Keith Fouth. Keith Fouth. Keith Fouth. Thank you. Anyone else? Juan and I have a friend. Her name is Sandy Long. And she is in her 80s. She's, but she's got cancer and she's at the end of her life. And if you could just keep her in your prayers. Um, and her, her family as well. Let's pray. Almighty God, how grateful we are that you do not treat us fairly. It sounds odd, I know, but Lord, we know had we received what we deserve, we would not be here. And yet you loved us so much. You wanted us to be a part of your life, your plan, your will so much that first you created us and then you redeemed us even though we rebelled. Almighty God, we thank you for Jesus. For it is in his name that we have assembled. It is in his name that we pray. It is in his name that we live and move and have our being. Thank you. We thank you for all the evidence around us that speaks of your glory. Even the rain this morning speaks of how you refresh us and cause us to grow. Even in the midst of the heartache of a funeral, you show yourself present by people who have gathered around a family, offered a service, whether it be in worship or at a meal, all of which speaks of your provision, your great love and grace. We thank you, Lord God, for all the times you have entered into our lives, some of which we were not even aware of. 
you have entered in and applied your grace to us and had given us life. Oh, we know we don't deserve it, for we are sinful people. We have not been what you call us to be. We have not heard the cry of the needy. We have not done what you call us to do. And yet for some reason, for some reason, you have promised that if we confess our sins, you will be faithful and you will forgive us. Thank you. Lord God, we remember this morning, Pat and the entire Garner family as they seek to pick up the pieces. I, as I pray for them, my heart goes out to anyone anywhere who has lost a loved one at any moment. Father God, uh, we think of Sandy and ask that you would surround her and, and the Long family as they begin the process of saying goodbye. I am grateful that Sandy and Herb were both ready to go home. And we look forward to that great reunion when we too will cross over the threshold. We pray for Keith Kauf this morning and ask in the name of Jesus that you would enter in and bring healing to his life, that you'd be with his family, that they find their strength in you. Bring them comfort, bring them peace. Above all else, Lord God, bring them faith. I thank you for each one who has gathered here this morning. For those who are listening and watching at home, we pray, Lord God, that you would suit a blessing to all of us, that we would live lives that speak of your goodness and your grace, even as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you to worship the Lord through your tithes and offerings as the ushers come forward. Would you stand as we sing together? Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. The words are on the screen before you. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wing. I see glory on each face. giving us love, showering with all your goodness and mercies. Mm. And we just ask that you take this little bit that we give back to you, that you may do with it as you deem fit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, Terry, the, the, um, I'm not sure how she's got the slides, but we're just going to sing the first verse 
and the chorus. She may have the chorus at the very end. I'm not sure. Okay. Just going to sing the first verse of number 338, where he leads me, I will follow. Let's sing together. I can hear my Savior call. benediction. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen.